This week's episode of Aussie Tech is brought to you by Start New Company. Register your company immediately today with ASIC. ABN, TFN, GST registration is also available directly from the portal. Also set up your family trust and self-managed superannuation fund and more. All at startnewcompany.com.au. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash startnewco and keep an eye out for our regular specials. Start your new company now within 10 minutes of lodgement. All legal company documentation provided after registration. startnewcompany.com.au Also brought to you by athwebhosting.com.au. All our servers are operating on SSD drives, immediate activation, SSL certificates, Aussie support, domain registration, and more. Easy install WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, and 300 other one click installations. Generous space and bandwidth, auto backups, WordPress help and maintenance plans are also available on contact. If your webpage is important for your business or your life, contact us today. Aussie support, secure services, athwebhosting.com.au. And now for the show. Welcome to episode 678 of the Aussie Tech Heads, recorded on the 21st of May, 2020. I'm your host, Jason Oakley, and this is my co-host, Will Tompkinson. Hey, Will. How do, how do? You notice a massive increase in production value this week? What? <laughs> Nobody believes that. <laughs> you know, it's my internet's doing random internet things, and... Uh... Your video's coming through crisp ads. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. I can send video to you perfectly. I can't receive your video or your audio hardly. Can't do a speed test. I get zero of anything on speed test. <laughs> but yet HD videos and stuff load from YouTube perfectly fine. But I can't connect my stream to any of the streaming services. <sighs> Have you tried turning it off and on again? That was where the problem started. I turned everything <laughs> off last night. I reckon that's what did it. Now you got to turn it on. Oh, yeah, baby. You're a sexy little router. Yeah. <laughs> You like that, don't you? Oh, what have I been up to? All day and night, city skylines, man. <laughs> I haven't played any Sim City type thing. I had The Sims, which was the little peoples walking around yeah, their houses yeah. and stuff for years. And then uh, just recently, I was looking through. I got I get a subscribe to a thing. Um, what do they call it? They, they have all the. Um, specials and stuff that are on in australia no. i was bargain no you sign up there and every day they email you and when i get really 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 bored i actually read the emails <laughs> and it was like free games for playstation and i was like oh okay, i suppose i'll go have a look at some lego game or something so i thought i'll have a look at that so i went in and um i was like yeah i'll get that see if they got any more oh yeah there's half a dozen things i'll just grab those they're free whatever I thought, oh, I remember somebody, a few people had been saying that City Skylines is a really good Sim mm. City type game. Maybe I should try it out. So I checked some videos and stuff. I thought, that looks all right. So I went to the Steam store and it's uh, in, in PlayStation store, it was like $54. And in the Steam store, it was 10 mm. for like another week or something. But if you pay... The, to get the, I think they call it the new starter pack. Yeah, you get a like few a expansion deal. add-ons, and yeah. it was like thirty-four dollars instead of fifty-four. <laughs> and I'm like, it's still better. I get all of the expansion stuff, so I try it out. And yeah, all day and night, I'm dragging my streets out and turning this into a residential area. And that one over there can be for commercial, and over there industrial. Now they start build. Oh, I got to join them together, and I need more power, more power, more water more everything uh now the people are unhappy i need medical i need cemeteries i need crematoriums i need ah uh, no it's a big mess now okay delete that start again right now i've got this i'll plan this no that's screwed up okay start i've probably started about eight different cities now 
But yeah. each time you learn something new and it's like, what if I do this this time instead of that? And then uh, <coughs> part of my problem was you have two roads coming into your block of land that you originally start with. Eventually you buy other blocks of land around and expand out. And I'd drag the and roads remember- down from the highway and then try and finagle some sort of design for the city. But recently I've discovered it's a lot, lot better if you start with designing the city layout and then somehow connect it back to the highway afterwards. Yeah. So you're the expert we should talk to if I've got any problems. <laughs> the concepts of it, but I still struggle. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I, I enjoy it. I've been playing it for a while. There is a multiplayer. Uh, we'll give it a go. There's a multiplayer hack that some people say works well. Some people say it doesn't work. And you get all these updates like photorealistic buildings and cars and yep. plugins and mods and add-ons and make this happen better and do that differently and automatic budget systems and manage micromanage roads. Like you can zoom right down to the road and say, all cars in this lane can only turn that way and all cars in that lane have to go straight ahead. And then if you've got certain parts of the city, you can block trucks and buses and only have foot traffic and there's all sorts of stuff mm. you can do. But and and that's just in the default pack. Then you can add add on packs to that, and it really lets you change stuff. Like there's a move it mod which lets you, you know, if there's a rock in the way or whatever, you can move it, or you can put a road where it doesn't want you to have one. There's um, the traffic management tool. There's uh, you know so roundabout builders, and there's all sorts of stuff. The more you play it, like, I I, t- I tend to stay away from the mods that affect. The AI. I don't like the AI's interactions with the way they do things. Keep it vanilla. Pain. I don't mind the things that in, improve that experience. Like there's a couple of mods that, uh, by the default game, only tells you if they're happy or sad. But there's a mod that actually tells you exactly which thing, whether it's medical, whether it's police, oh, whether it's right. fire. There's, it tells you exactly which thing they want. Now, I like that one because it, it gives you more information. So I have to find but, that one too. There's so many different ways of playing it. You can play it, you know, with budget, without budget. Um, you know, with give finance. yourself a gazillion dollars and just put in everything and have fun being a creator, like creative mood in Minecraft. Yeah, I tend to. It, it's funny. I don't generally do that. I I prefer to play it with fun, with money. I find that it, it forces me to make the cities function correctly because when you don't have money, you can just throw. <laughs> throw money at a problem nuclear reactors problem, here's know. a line of 200 <laughs> nuclear reactors i'm never going to run out of electricity now but when you when you're struggling for money and you're just trying to make the city survive yeah i find it much nicer to uh, actually be playing properly with funds and it, it forces you to think of creative creative solutions to problems i thought i'd screwed up the latest one i'm doing because i'd lay put down all these st- streets where i want stuff <laughs> connect up electricity water and stuff and I'm going into the negative, and I'm going into the negative, and there's some other people who are like, we need water, electricity. I'm like, I've got no money. Yeah, yeah that happens. And then... and then I'm like, what am I going to do? Do I have to start again? I'll let it go for a bit longer. And then slowly the negatives disappeared and people moved in and then started paying taxes and started coming yep. back. <coughs> I was like, okay, now I can start putting in more electricity, more water, and came yep. back again. So that Very, was very fickle balancing point. But no, it's a good game. I've been playing it for quite a while. I quite enjoy it. It's uh, definitely value for money. Speaking of good game, I was watching Stephanie Ben Dixon doing a stream the other night. She's doing it for um, Beyond Blue Charity, so I donated some money for Hi. it. And she said, thank you, Warlock. <laughs> well, she said, thank you, Well, well okay, well okay. <laughs> Thank you for that donation. <laughs> I was like, doesn't matter. Hex said my name. It's great. <laughs> uh, As well yeah. as pretending to be on a Zoom meeting with my boss and other stuff on my team. But don't tell them they don't watch this show. <laughs> Clearly working hard. <laughs> I'm hardly working. Uh, right. How about you? 
has stuff going up there now. Oh, Besides your uh, broken computer internet. Yeah. Uh, you know, plodding along. Um, getting my... I've, I've had, like, my Delta 3D printer, the one I bought for, like, 150 bucks. It, it's a workhorse. It just plods along and behaves itself. Um, and I've had a Prusa i3 sitting up there for ages, just... I got it off somebody, they couldn't get it working properly, and I sort of looked at it, rated a couple of parts off it, and chucked it up on the shelf and haven't looked at it. Um, But I've decided I'm going to get it up and running and functioning, so I've been printing stuff. This is the cool part with the 3D printer. Once you've got a 3D printer, you can create better 3D printers. So I've been printing heads and printing mounting points and bracketry and stuff off that to make my other one work. I'm going to turn it into a dual head one so I can print different colors and stuff like that. But... um, I hope you've got a lot of room there for putting all your printers and stuff up. Yeah. No, it's not too bad. But I'm going to um, turn my Delta printer, I'm going to make it a um, like a prototyping printer. So it'll be set up to print probably slightly less accurate but very fast. So if you want to design a product, you can pump it out real quick and just get it a proof of concept before you spend the time, you know. You're going to do some CNC as well, weren't you? I've got that. I've got that. That's in the shed. I just got to actually get around to getting that finalised as well, because <clears throat> um, I'm going to use um, Octoprint, Octopi. You can use for all of these things, so I have them all set up on that. But um, yeah, so I'm going to make that a workhorse. And I, I was running low on filament, so I decided to order some filament and saw a really good special on filament, and um, I ordered it, and it was great, and it turned up, and well. Let's just say it's 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 wrong. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Um, there, there's two common filament sizes. There's 1.75 and three mil, uh, and there's two common plastics, PLA and ABS, um, both of which have their benefits and their downsides. That, that, but all my printers are set up for 1.75 mil, um, and when you order three mil, three mil doesn't fit into a 1.75 mil hole. Nope. <laughs> so I now have eight rolls of three mil. Um, <laughs> you need a new hot end. So, the problem at the moment, so I've discovered, is 3D printer parts in Australia are very, very limited. The everybody's sold out of everything ah. um, because everybody's using their printers to print masks and PPE stuff and and whatever, or just general downtime. They're printing more than they usually are. Yeah, I'm at and home it, all day. I might as well do something. Yeah. And to get uh, spare parts for printers at the moment is just near impossible. Dang. Um, I can order them out of China, obviously, but which I don't have a problem doing generally. But the problem at the moment is take a month to get there. <laughs> yeah, it's it. Like you look even on Amazon or anything like that, ordering stuff from from China can be two to three months. I ordered some stuff from the UK at the start of March, and I just got it last week. Hmm. Yeah, but I've ordered stuff from Sydney, and it's taken a month to get here. So you know, <laughs> it's, it's not saying a lot. Um, but yeah, so that's going to be fun. So now I've hopefully printed off enough stuff because I'm completely out of filament now. So hopefully I've printed off enough stuff that I can modify what I've got to make it work well enough with the three mil print, so that I can print more stuff to make it work better. Right. <laughs> you got to print the stuff to print the stuff. Yeah. yeah, if you can print it badly, it's better than using, like, say, for example, there's one mounting point and I could use a zip tie to hold it on. Well, that will work enough to print it badly. Then that badly print that badly printed part will work better than the zip tie. So when I put that in and then print with that, the component's better again. Yep. So you can do that two or three times and you can end up with a much higher quality component than you started with. Yep. So it's a really interesting... One thing I do love about that, problem solving the ability of a 3d printer to create to self it's a self-creating process effectively it's really cool cool so but uh yeah before we get into stories i do have to mention now that we do have a patreon oh, uh, who well, is he technically <laughs> we've had, technically we've had patreon set up since like 2015 or something glenn set it up but we've never actually used it um How but i've got two it? I got two over. I got two over it. I got over to it. I got around to it. There we go. 
<laughs> during the week. My mum so, had one of them. It was a magnetic one stuck on the fridge around. around to it. Yeah, yeah, Dad's got one as well. Um, he's got a gunner do as well. <laughs> um, so you can go to patreon.com slash Aussie Tech Heads and you'll come to our landing page there and you'll see there's all different there's different levels and, and stuff if you if you wish to support us. We do have to give a shout out to Chris. He's our first Patreon. Woo! And, uh, he says, uh, happy to support local Aussie tech shows. Keep up the good work. And um, thanks for the time and effort you guys put into producing the show with on a weekly basis. Oh, does that mean we have to come back every week now? <laughs> so actually now we've got it. Now we're under pressure. We've got to do it weekly now. Dun, dun, um, dun, 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 under pressure. <laughs> but basically, so... Uh, things are getting more expensive. Like we we haven't been monetized on YouTube. We don't have the views or the the followership. Follow, wow, the fellowship or the followers on on YouTube to be monetized. Um, so we've just and we been have to it. pay money to host the audio as well. Yeah, you know we have, don't have sponsors. I mean, we the show's you know not unsponsored. We all do it voluntarily. You know, put our own money in to pay for the. Hosting of the radio station, uh, pay for the hosting of the um, the podcast hosting, pay for Zoom um, licensing. You know, there's 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 money that goes in, and we don't mind doing that. Hmm. But over the last couple of months, price everybody and all the basically all the components we use, whether it's the recaster, whether it's you know all the stuff we're using, they're all putting their prices up. So, you know, if you guys want to throw us a couple of bucks we're more than happy to take it there's a way you can do it now you can just go to Aussie Tech Heads um, on Patreon patreon.com slash Aussie Tech Heads or just search for Aussie Tech Heads on Patreon and bring it up as well yep. um, and go there and chuck us a couple of bucks it'd be fantastic do we eat? But, you know, don't feel obliged of course we're still going to bring you the show if you don't but all the money that does go into that will go back into the show it'll go into paying for hosting and stuff like that um, it'll go into equipment upgrades um, we do have stretch goals on there. Um, we might be able we... to afford to get Glenn to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's that. Uh, yeah, we do have the stretch goals on there of ultimately being self-sufficient to the point where we can um, take the show on the road and do mobile things from different places and go to events and seminars and all that sort of stuff where we don't have to be, uh, you know, just, just working from home. So ultimately that that's kind of the the big agenda you know um maybe even have enough money where we can host a aussie tech Ed's christmas party or something and yeah get some get some people around so but yeah you know if you feel like if you feel like we do a half decent job and you want to chuck us a couple of bucks we're not going to complain but i always try to do a half decent job <laughs> at, the rest at, of at, it's indecent <laughs> at, at the maximum we try and do a half decent job <laughs> <laughs> that's on a good day it so so once again thanks chris and um thanks to everybody else who who continues to support us you might get a shout out too yeah there's different tiers there everybody gets a shout out but if as you go through the tiers some people get the names in the credits and some people if you go up into the bigger tiers you get free web domain hosting and stuff like that so so go and check it out and see if there's something there that you could be interested in i have some different tiers when the show ends (laughs) oh dear and there's no more Aussie tech. They're usually tears of joy, though. So just... Shh, you're not supposed <laughs> to tell them that. Yeah. Some news. YouTube on Wednesday announced a new bedtime reminders feature. Hey, <laughs> this is help... your story. <laughs> yeah, to help even the most dedicated of extremely online types log off late at night. The new feature joins the platform's existing take a break reminders. And both are among a broader set of YouTube wellness and screen time tools released in 2018 as part of Google's digital well-being initiative. The ultimate goal is to help users more responsibly use Google products, an issue that's intensified during the coronavirus pandemic as more and more of our time is spent inside staring at screens. YouTube says it sent 3 million take a break reminders over the last two years. Now with bedtime reminders, YouTube says you can set specific times to stop watching videos and, you guessed it, go to bed. The company writes in a post, you start set start and end times in your settings, including whether or not you want a prompt to interrupt a video or wait until the video is over. You'll also be able to dismiss or snooze the reminder. YouTube says the feature will be available on its Android and iOS apps starting today, but it will likely take a few days to roll out to everyone. Hmm. That sounds um, useless. 
Yep, I'm not going to use it. <laughs> Why would I? I if, get... if I was going to stop watching the YouTube video, I'm... I'd t put the phone over there and go to sleep. Not let it, not fall asleep four times and let it smack me in the face. That's part of the. <laughs> That's, that's the routine I'm using. That's the now. beauty of it. I wait for it to hit me in the face four times, then I know it's bedtime. <laughs> I mean, I get it for... Um, kids you know, and college students, kids, maybe. Kids, it's a good idea. You know, Not that I generally send Bub to bed with the tablet, but occasionally in lunchtime or whatever, you'll sit there and you know watch it. And we use the timeout feature. He gets you know to watch it for half an hour and it shuts off on him. So yep. stuff like that's handy. Um, I have... Google Home in his room and it does uh, plays a nighttime routine you know stuff like that so it, it, it's alright but I I can't really see a use for a go to sleep feature like you're either going to go to sleep or you're not which, and if you're going to go to sleep chances are the reason you've got YouTube on is because you go to sleep watching the video that's what puts you to sleep so and as it is autoplay stops I've noticed one thing I have noticed, during the day, we can have a song list playlist or whatever on during the day and it plays perfectly fine. Overnight, after about 10 or 11 o'clock of a night, if you're playing a playlist, every like second video, it stops and asks if you're still awake. Sounds like Netflix. Or you're still watching. So it kind of already does that anyway. Um, it's the only good thing about having Netflix going to my Chromecast and I'm lying in bed just binge watching a TV series or something. It's like, are you still watching this? Yeah. I can just say to my Google Nest speaker, yes, keep playing. All right, then, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, and that, that's handy because obviously if you're asleep, well, it can turn off and save bandwidth. And I, I understand that point of view, but I don't get the. Th it's like saying, it's like setting your alarm clock to go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> You know, your alarm clock goes off, so you run to your bedroom and shut it off and then go to sleep. Like that. It, it, My it, Fitbit has stuff too. It's like bedtime reminders on your Fitbit. You should be going to sleep now. Yeah, I know, but I don't <laughs> feel like it. So you can go away and I'm going to look at Reddit and Twitter for another hour. Yeah, I, I don't really understand that, that feature. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, it's there for somebody. Somebody must use it. One thing I did discover the other day, well, there's two things, though. Gmail, um, I had, and I didn't realize I did, because I almost never send an email from my Gmail account. I'm still sending it from work. Yep. Apparently, at some point, I turned on the um, the drunk um, the drunk filter, so you can't accidentally send emails when you're drunk. It actually asks you three maths questions before it lets you send the email. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten that was even a thing, but I went to send an email that I'm like, what? Why? What? What's two and, plus nine? <laughs> and then I, I did it and I'm like, I'm going through my settings and what's going on? And then, because I wanted to change my, um, because I noticed sometimes on my phone I'll accidentally hit archive instead of delete. Yep. Um, and normally by the time the undo thing comes up, it's too late and I miss it, but I've found you can actually change that to 10 seconds up from, well, up to 30 seconds now instead oh, of three okay. seconds. Yeah. So I was turning that up, and then I noticed, oh, the drunken text, the drunken email <laughs> things. And I'm like, okay, I don't remember doing that, but let's just turn that off. <laughs> yeah, I'll send a text if I'm drunk. You can't stop me. Yeah, well, that's a great feature. You're not my mum. I can literally just go and turn it off. Like, how? how why? What's <laughs> what? The drunk me not know how to do that? <laughs> no, apparently not. Uh, you should be able to just put on a list of people who you don't want to drunk text or drunk <laughs> email. Say, so these ones are fine, but that one, that one and that one, don't let me send emails to them until the next day unless I can figure out what 5 times 7 plus 9 is. So never then? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the best way to do it. Well, what I, what the thing I discovered too is that it... Um, it uh, detects if you've got the calculator app open on your phone. Oh, okay. It closes it. All righty. Now, for you. people who have used Windows for a while, um, or especially, and even Linux to, to more degree, are probably aware of 
terminal. Mm. It's a, a, a slightly more powerful version of um, the command prompt. So, you know, it, it lets you do... If you use the Linux, you'll understand what how it, it works and lets you basically do all the commands and do everything. And back in the day of DOS, you used to be able to run a lot of stuff from the, the back end bef and not so much in Windows. It was more powerful to do it and quicker to do it that way. And there were programs like Extra Gold and whatever that would let you do yeah, it. Yeah, Extra Gold! <laughs> um, but what they have just what they have Windows has released now is um, they have released Windows Terminal version 1, build 2020, which is obviously for this year. Sweet. And what you can see there is that that kind of actually looks similar to uh, ASCII screen in, X, in X3 Gold. Yeah. Um, but they have, if you're used to Linux, there's a, a, a part of it called screen that lets you have multiple, I guess, multiple um, instances. Yeah, of, I used to use that all the time when I dial into somewhere, start up a screen session, do multiple stuff, and then you can detach from it. Come back the next day, reattach from where you were, and keep on working. Doesn't knock mm. you out of everything. So they have a similar feature in here where they have four. Um, they have four separate instances ah. of it running. Um, and you'll see the Ubuntu thing there. I'll come back to that in a minute. But yeah, you can see it's Microsoft Windows version. You know, Windows ten. Um, text file in there and a process limit there and. You can see down the bottom right there's an actual Linux screen. Command line. Um, but, um, yeah, so so they're implementing that as part of their Linux on the Windows desktop feature that they're rolling out. Um, they're running, they're actually going to be running a dedicated subsystem for Linux under nice. Windows. So, you can run Linux GUI apps on there. Yeah, run them natively rather than running them through a... a are using GNOME, program. are they? Um, yeah, I'd imagine it's so. In the next, par next paragraph halfway, it's got GNOME. Yeah, using um, Genome. Uh, oh, okay, desktop. Get a developer, Emac. Sweet. Yeah. Um, so you see, currently Linux has about 1% of users. Um... <laughs> One major company, however, still believes in the Linux desktop. Microsoft. Yay. <laughs> Hang on a minute. <laughs> I was reading where was it Satya Nadella from there was saying, yeah, we screwed up when we um, said that Linux wasn't important back in the day. We should have been doing all this stuff from the start. Yeah. Well, given that Windows is based on Linux, written with Linux. Much and it's po got POSIX support. Yeah. Um... So yeah, starting with Ubuntu, then they're going uh, Red Hat, Suzy, Sled, um, then eventually Microsoft currently has its own Linux kernel that they're using, but it's it's not uh, graphical, it's just for the text-based side of it at the moment. Oh, yeah. But then eventually, yeah, you'll be able, they're going to implement the GUI side of it, be able to run X, -win, X server or X -win. Um So the neat it's part It's like the opposite of having wine. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Well, yeah, I mean, it is. And you've, you've been able to do it for a while. Um, you've been able to do it for a while on using virtual machine. The biggest problem is when you use a virtual machine, if you want to, say, use your SD card or you want to use, you know, you've got all this extra setup involved in doing something simple like using a USB hub. Like, for example, if I wanted to use this audio mixer and my webcam under VMs, machine I would not only need to set it up and get it working under Windows and then load up the Linux kernel and then have it load up all these hack drivers to make it share the the thing between Windows and Linux. Yeah, it's just it's never been pretty. So this is really gonna clean up that that process and, and allow um allow that to be much more streamlined. So for example like the ninety I could effectively use Linux like ninety nine percent of the things that I do on a regular basis would yep. work perfectly fine under Linux, but there's always been that one percent of things that's just stopping me from making a full transition to Linux. 
Um, and wine but, doesn't do everything. <laughs> no, wine, wine. Once again, it's still an emulator. So, no, wine stands for wine is not an emulator. <laughs> so it's still an emulator. Um, <laughs> it's just pretending it's not. <laughs> but it basically, it means you're still using more hardware, you're using more memory, you're still using more resources to do simple applications. So, whilst it is a good implementation, it's still limited by the fact that it, at the end of the day, it's still emulating Windows. Yeah. Um, so, to have native support for Linux in Windows would be great because you know you have all your open source, you have all your your your, especially a lot of people, a lot of a lot of um, companies use Linux because it is quite secure, but the, a lot of them have the same problem. I know one guy works for a company and he has to carry two. He has two different laptops because he has their Linux laptop, and then he has the new Windows 10 laptop, which they can't combine the two, even with dual boot, because some of the hardware that's on his Windows laptop won't work under the new versions of Linux, and some of the stuff that's on his Linux laptop, the hardware won't work under Windows 10. So <laughs> he, like, he physically has to carry two separate laptops with two operating systems. Because when he's at one part of the work, one part of the where he works, they use Linux, and yeah. then in the other more like officey sort of part of the shop, they use Windows. So he's he's constantly he's physically switching between two laptops. So something like this would be perfect. Um, yeah. As long as they do things like <clears throat> the the thing that's going to be interesting is whether Microsoft's going to release back catalogs of hardware support drivers and stuff like that think hope so you know because that's always been an issue like logitech webcams work at kind linux but you can't use microsoft webcams they just don't release the drivers for them you can use a generic driver but the quality of the camera suffers you know so stuff like that would be interesting to see um what they're doing with that but it's definitely a good uh good way of doing it yeah. um the one thing <clears throat> obviously yet yeah, they haven't got graphical implementation working yet but it's going to be interesting to see even that is natively running under Windows. It'd be interesting to see how much um, resource effect it has running the two OSs. Even though they're going to be natively running side by side, there's not going to be any emulation. So obviously, hardware requirements going to be a lot less. But I'm pretty much say there would be some effect on the hardware. There'd have to be, you'd think. We applaud the new Microsoft direction. Yeah, it's it's a, it goes. I mean, it's really interesting. It it effectively goes against everybody they've everything they've stood for for the last 20 years yeah um the the microsoft and they go more open source too well yeah i mean uh, microsoft's the exact opposite of open source yeah. but you know they they actively go i remember a story back when i think it was when windows swim well, windows 7 came out may even be a bit earlier than that but i remember them going actively after a charity who is donating computers with Windows 3.1, um, they actively went after this charity and sued them out of existence for doing that because they said, we don't support that software anymore, so you can't use it. Yep. And they're like, well, okay, give us something we can use. And they're like, no, you're not having any of our software for free and we're going to sue you because you're using software that we don't use anymore. <laughs> of course, that makes sense. <laughs> Good on you, Microsoft. So, you know... <laughs> I've never really liked Microsoft. It just everything you buy, like the drivers for this mixer, for example, are only available in Windows. They're, they're not available in Linux. Yeah. But with this pairing, it can mean that um, potentially could ditch. Like, if the drivers work natively under Linux, paired with Windows, theoretically the drivers will work natively with Linux. Full stop. You hope so. And if that's the case, then I can ditch Windows altogether. I don't need it. I just need the drivers that I can't get. <laughs> well, Windows is now, in the last few years, has gone more Windows operating system agnostic. They put their Office 365 in the cloud on so the you cloud. can use it from yeah. anything. You can get Office products but on your Android, on your on iPhone. The, the, the Office on the cloud still doesn't work for crap on a Mac. My boss has got three or four systems and they forever having problems with it so uh, whilst technically you can it is very bad experience yeah yeah um but no you're right they but i mean is that just uh you know you think okay office on the cloud well obviously people who are using linux aren't going to use that because they've already got open office and they've got everything they need so mm. and google docs 
So the only, the only extra people you're going to entice are people who are using a Mac and the software runs like crap on a Mac. So, so does it, do it really? on your iPhone and your Android, though? Yeah, yeah. Um, but you've it's always good, been... Because a... before you had to have Windows mobile device and not, not one of them has ever been good, has it, to be honest? No. But with with Google, with the advent of Google Docs and and um, uh, open up Docs stuff too, and stuff on mobile platforms. Now I don't have I don't have Office on my mobile, but I can I can. I don't have it on my desktop. No, I don't have it on my desktop either. I got it on the work computer only because it came with it when I bought the computer. Yeah, I don't use it. No, <laughs> <I> still, <laughs> it's there. I still use Open Office. <laughs> I've got LibreOffice on, I think it's LibreOffice or Apache, one of the two, on my phone that I use. Yep. If I can't get, you know, if I need to do up a document or something, I don't have Signal and can't access Google Docs. Um, but, I mean, you got to look, just look at what they're doing with, you know, it's almost like in some regards they've forgotten about the consumer because, Lately, everything they've done has been commercial focus. Right. You know, their new business suite they've just released, their new um, service stuff, support they've just bought out, their new um, commercial um, 360 webcams for meetings and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of it all seems to be business and commercial based. They don't really, they haven't really done anything for the average, average consumer recently. So, I don't know. About time they did. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it's a, at the end of the day, it's still. They give us Minecraft. <laughs> that was probably the start of their foray into open source. Yeah. <laughs> Not technically open source, but you can modify it and you can do a fair bit with it. So. so we should keep a nice segue with what you were just talking about. When you've got Linux, there's different package managers for software you can use. Yep. Lots. Apt-get. Mm -hmm. Dpackage, Yast, which is yet another software tool. And now Microsoft surprised Windows users with a new package manager yesterday. It's a command line tool that allows developers, power users, and really any Windows user to install their favorite apps from a simple command. If you had to have to wipe a Windows machine clean or set up a new device, you know the pain of having to reinstall apps, find download links, and get the PC ready again. Windows Package Manager aims to solve that, and it's really simple to create a script to have your favorite apps installed from a command prompt. The Windows Store should be the central location for all Windows apps, but Microsoft's initial universal Windows platform push meant traditional and useful Win32 desktop apps were never listed in the store. That's changed in the years since Windows 10's debut, but the store still feels like abandonware. Most power users and even developers have ignored the Windows Store in favor of packet managers like Chocolatey. I haven't heard of that one, but it sounds interesting. Mm. Or we use uh, Nine Night for installing a lot of stuff, right? Else they manually download apps from the web. Microsoft creating its own Windows package manager, WinGet, is significant, and the command line tool is already more useful than the Windows Store. You can navigate to a command prompt, type winget install steam, and the latest version of Valve Steam app will be installed on your system. Steam doesn't even exist in the Windows Store right now, and there are many apps available on winget like Zoom, WinRa, and Logitech Harmony Remote that are also missing from the store. As Windows Package Manager is only available in preview and 24 hours old, it doesn't have every app listed that you might want just yet. Windows Store apps aren't available in WinGet yet as Microsoft is maintaining its own separate repository of apps and validating them. Store app support is planned for a future update though. The whole project is open source, so other package managers can leverage the company's validated packages. Software vendors will be able to use Windows Package Manager as a distribution channel for apps just like the Windows Store. Using WinGet does require an element of trust though. One critical concern they had was how to build a repository of trusted applications. Uh, Demetrius Nilon, a senior program manager at Microsoft said, we are automatically checking each manifest. We leverage smart screen statistic, uh, static analysis, SHA-256 hash validation, a few other processes to reduce the likelihood of malicious software making its way into the repository and onto your machine. 
So it's basically that Windows store they've had on the phones for years and didn't do anything with and decided to do something with it. Yeah. <clears throat> so Better late than never. Those 12 developers that are actively working on it might have something to do now. <laughs> Well, they tried to copy the Apple App Store, and that obviously didn't work at all, and was completely ignored for crappy apps and stuff getting on there. So now that was one of the like, I didn't mind the Windows Phone experience on some of the phones; it worked quite well, but you couldn't do anything. There were no apps available. Yeah, you know, like you just couldn't, you couldn't do stuff. Is mission critical stuff you needed to do because there was no developers for the for the platform yeah everyone expected microsoft was going to abandon it so they didn't make it which self-fulfilled and they abandoned it because they didn't make it hmm yeah i don't know what's yeah i don't know that's weird that they um they've gone that way now like they they've been training everybody for years to not use the command line now suddenly they make this a command line tool yep <laughs> Isn't it ironic, don't you think? I wonder if this is part of that whole terminal experience that they're releasing. Yeah. Because there is a whole swag of tools to go with that, so maybe it's something to do. Maybe they... That and PowerShell are taking over everything, aren't they? Well, yeah. I mean, I wonder if maybe that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get people... As they said, they made a mistake so long ago and said Linux wasn't any good, but every I did, they've recently the things that they are proposing is very Linux like. Yeah. So maybe there is that that learning lessons. That they're trying to get people to do everything through the terminal, through the shell, just because yes, you can have an app that does it, but it's so much more efficient just to do it directly to the you know, to the OS rather than going through a third party app. They're bringing back auto exec dot bat, aren't they? <laughs> Uh, config.sys. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a problem with that. I think I've still got mine backed up on a floppy somewhere. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> What's a floppy? Yeah, You're I'm just right. inventing words now, Mr. T. You're <laughs> such a hilarious joker, aren't you? Floppy disk and CD-ROMs and stuff. The funny thing is people who think of floppy disks, they weren't floppy anyway. People no. don't realise there actually was a floppy disk before that. <laughs> the five and a quarter inch was. Yeah, and the nine and a half. Yeah. Now you're just bragging. <laughs> the nine and a half inch floppy. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty big when you held it in your hand. Yeah. Yeah. It was really slow, though. That was the only problem. It took forever to reach where it needed to get to. Tends to be the way. They were, they were only, what were they? Four meg? They were tiny, anyway, compared to the, relatively speaking, the, you know, the platter was four times the size of a the smaller disk and it was only like double the amount of data or something. Yeah. <laughs> it was you had single sided, single density, your single single dot single sided standard density, double sided standard density, and double sided double density. So the one floppy disk could be three sixty K, seven twenty K or one point four, depending on how many holes it had punched in the side of it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's how it worked. <laughs> then there was an issue, I remember we had a problem where was it zip disk had two meg disks and they tried to make them backward compatible with the 1.4s because they used SCSI drivers they couldn't boot so everybody bought these things to put in their drive then had a hard drive crash and could realize they couldn't actually boot off these <laughs> devices so nobody had bootable floppies or anymore uh... and they wouldn't boot off the zip disk because the zip disk needed the SCSI drivers to work and yep. uh... <laughs> Wow, yeah, those were the good I had a parallel port zip drive. Parallel port. Oh, that huge transfer speed. Right. Nine, was it 96K, I think it is? Max out of it? Eventually it, it got that click of death and... Like every single zip drive ever. Yeah. The yellow ones were worse than the blue ones, but the blue ones weren't much better. Yeah, mine was blue. Then they had the jazz. Jazz. Jazz drive. That was a horrible... <laughs> I never had one of them. That made zip drives look amazing. Yeah. <laughs> had so much trouble with those. Because the worst part was companies were using them. They were never designed. They were designed as a private backup, backup your documents and be done with it. 
Yeah. But companies are trying to back up their servers on these 250 meg jazz disks that just shit themselves at the slightest bit of, you know, dust or moisture or. But it's a big wrong. drive. It's got to be good. <laughs> yeah, but they had. Was it nine gig, eight gig, um, BLT drives, tape drives. Yeah. Back when hard drives were only, you know, 250 meg, they had like eight or nine gig tape drives. <laughs> they were slow, but yep. they just continually ran. And then when they filled up, they rewound and started again. Yep. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, enough of that. <laughs> Any more stories for you? Um, Zoom buys Keybase to help build end-to-end encryption. Wow. As it tries to squash security. Governments won't like that. Yeah, I know, right? Zoom Video Communications will launch consultant... Con- cons- yeah, it'll, it'll launch Sultanas. Yeah, that's the oh, word. nice. <laughs> Wow. Just those little it, square packets about that big. <laughs> it will launch consultations on May 22nd. Uh, on the first draft of cryptography, it plans to use offer use to. Oh, that's it. I'm going to bed. See ya. Bye night. I'll finish off the show by myself. Oh, that was Mr. T. He's gone all blurry <laughs> now anyway. He must be tired. It's. It, um, what's with that? <laughs> Speaking of Microsoft drivers. Hello. No, He's whatever. Coming back. <laughs> Focus. Yay. There we go. <laughs> um, offers, planning to offer end-to-end encryption meeting to all paying subscribers as it seeks to squash criticism of its platform over security. So there's more to that story, but Reuters want me to sign up and that ain't going to happen. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was also reading that they've blocked... Uh, their free accounts from China subscriptions as well. So China businesses that want to pay for their business packages, they'll let them, but they're not allowing free uh, they're not allowing free plans in China. So that should help a bit as well. <laughs> um that was not the story. I just Yeah anyway. Shall I get one? I did that thing where you close two tabs by mistake. Uh, there you go, you're all right. Tab history. Yeah, that's what I'm working on. Do you got another one? Yes. Facebook yep. and Instagram are making their biggest push yet into online shopping with Facebook Shops, which allows businesses to turn their Facebook and Instagram pages into online storefronts for their fans and followers. Facebook, yeah. as with pretty much all its recent product updates, is billing the feature as one that will further help small businesses. I think it'll further help facebook's bottom line if you ask me but anyway will further help small businesses affected by the economic fallout of covid19 the update which is starting to roll out now is also the company's biggest move into e-commerce yet with shops business owners can create a dedicated shop section of their facebook or instagram page and build out a catalog of their products for users to browse and buy importantly most actual purchases won't be happening on facebook Product listings will be directed to a business's existing website unless it's one of a handful of companies using Facebook or Instagram's in-app checkout feature. Instead, Facebook shops will draw businesses' social media fans to their products and help lure new ones. Companies naturally can buy targeted Facebook ads for specific product listings as well. And shop owners can chat with potential customers on Messenger, WhatsApp and Instagram Direct. Instagram, which has always already been uh, home to many of Facebook's experiments with shopping, will push Facebook's new commerce features even more aggressively. The company plans to give shopping its own section of the app, which will replace the current activity tab in an expected update later this year. But hang on, they've already got Facebook Marketplace and they've already got Facebook Store because I use Store. <coughs> this is, is shops. It's not a store. It's a shop. But I have all my products listed on the store, and I use it as a store, and it's got a checkout and stuff already. But that's not a shop; it's a store. <laughs> Don't you understand? So what? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Facebook is like, well, we managed to make our products a little bit leaner. We need to bloat them again. Get people buying, da- downloading huge Facebook apps again. Is, okay, so it's an app. It's not from the Facebook page. Well, it'd be built into Facebook, yeah. They might have a separate app, I don't know. Because like the, shop, the shop works directly through Facebook. 
Like, okay, maybe that's what the difference is going to be. Maybe it's going to be, but no, they're saying it's handled through this the uh, the website of the. Hmm. <laughs> what? <laughs> but if I had a what shop already, why would now? I? If I already had a store that I run and manage, why would I run it through Facebook just to add more? I I'm really confused by that proposition. <laughs> I, honestly, it, I can't. Not, I just no. I have nothing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Facebook. <laughs> Thank you, Facebook, for just whatever. Just for whatever it is that you, you you're doing. I'm sure, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> Samsung made a Galaxy S20 Tactical Edition for the military. Whoa. So we know they've got the normal Is it CQR? Um, it's it's uh, an aw- awesome looking bit of kit. Whoa. So, Is that a Nokia? <laughs> so that's the S20 un- underlying technology, but it's in a, obviously a weatherproof, dustproof, dropproof, shockproof case. Nice. Um, and then it's got a massive GPS antenna and... Um, Why has it got an iPod click wheel in the middle of it? That's the navigation software, <laughs> I think. The mapping software. But yeah, no, it, it just looks like an awesome bit of kit. Um, unfortunately, it's for the military, but they've hardened their version of the Galaxy S20. Um, you probably, yeah, don't reach your credit card. It's not what you're expecting. You probably can't buy one anyway. The company's introduced the Galaxy S20 Tactical Edition. As the name suggests, it's designed to meet the needs of the U.S. military and federal government. Touts two layers of encryption strong enough to handle top-secret data and connects to tactical radios and mission systems out of box. The combat-related convenience is two. One mode can turn the display on and off while you're wearing night vision goggles, while stealth mode turns off LTE and minus and mutes all RF broadcasts to eliminate even the slightest chance of eavesdropping. It's also easy to unlock the phone in landscape mode so that you can quickly launch an app with the device to your chest. Um, and the otherwise run-of-the-mill Galaxy S20 with 6.2-inch 1440p display, Snapdragon 865, 12GB RAM, 128GB expandable, 4,000 mil- 4, mAh battery, and the usual arrays of front and rear cameras. Although Samsung shows tactical edition and rugged casing, there's no mention of the power phone itself being rugged. So the S20 variant will be available in the third quarter of the year from select IT channel partners. If you get one, there's a good chance it'll have been issued to you as part of a bulk order. So it might be good news if you're either a soldier eager for a tactical communications upgrade or an official who regularly handles classified data. Hmm. <laughs> I just want one because it looks awesome. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wasn't going to buy another. I tell you what, I was never going to buy another brand, big brand phone like Samsung or whatever. But if they released that to the public and went, "Here's two, it's two thousand bucks, but you can throw it across the workshop and it'll never break," I'll go, "Yes, no worries. I'll take three. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean, like. <laughs> That would just be an awesome looking bit of gear. I could handle. Make all that. your friends jealous. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that'd be great just because you know I'm good at breaking things. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Exploit acquisition firm Zerodium has announced this week that it's no longer buying certain types of iOS exploits due to surplus, and the company expects prices to drop in the near future. Zerodium said on Twitter it would no longer acquire iOS local privilege escalation, Safari remote execution and sandbox escape exploits in the next two to three months due to a high number of submissions related to these vectors. The company says it expects prices to drop for one-click exploit chains that do not provide persistence. Chalky Brera, CEO and founder of Zerodium, said on Twitter that only pointer authentication codes that provide protection against unexpected changes to pointers in memory and difficulty to achieve persistence are holding iOS security from going to zero. iOS security is fucked, said Bikra, noting that they are already seeing many exploits designed to bypass PAC and a few zero-day exploits that can help an attacker achieve persistence on all iPhones and iPads. Let's hope iOS 14 will be better, he added. The demand for both iOS and Android exploits has always been very high, but the supply was low due to technical challenges faced during development of these exploits. However, for the last few months, we've observed a spike in the number of iOS submissions, specifically Safari remote code execution, sandbox escapes, and privilege escalations. And we are forced to react by first reducing our prices and now by pausing our acquisitions of such capabilities for the next two to three months. 
The spike is likely caused by the increased number of researchers looking into iOS and probably the availability of public jailbreaks, which are helping researchers to reverse engineer iOS devices more easily and find bugs faster. On the other hand, the number of Android submissions remain stable. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, iOS, not quite as secure as originally thought. Who originally thought? <clears throat> Apple, I think. <laughs> Maybe they're the only ones. Uh, it's never been secure. It's just been... I mean, I mean, it's probably more secure than a Windows phone. I'll give them that. Yep. Mind you, how many people hacked Windows phones? So, you know. Nobody cared. <laughs> um, any more stories with you? One quick one. So, okay. We're up. We had uh, SD cards. And then we had the SD... Uh, HCs, which was the high capacity ones. Yep. Um, then they had the uh, SD Express. Um, but now they've got the SD. The SD Association has unveiled the version 8 specifications for the SD Express that promises up to um, 4 gig a second transfer rate, which is four mm. times faster than the current spec. Nice. Uh, and it may be quicker than your SSD drive in your wow. computer. Wow. <laughs> that says a lot, doesn't it? Uh, it's taking the standard, still uses the NVMe Express protocol, but it's taking advantage of two lane PCIe 4 connection to get even more bandwidth, which is the, the SSDs I have in my computer are the PCIe ones. Um, so they're like 50 gig a second, I think, transfer. Nice. Um, but basically, so. Not only does it, um, the new, new SD Express will support larger storage capacities. Um, so you could theoretically buy a 128 terabyte card in the not too distant future. Cool. Um, so basically, yeah, so you can have a 128 terabyte card that transfers data at 4 gig a second. Um, so. They, if once again the reliability thing comes into it, because the faster the card, the bigger the card, the more likely the fail. You just talk to any videographer or photographer or YouTuber, and they'll yep. tell you that they most of them still use the smaller cards because the bigger ones, you know, you stay away from your top two sizes, um, two or three sizes, and you sort of use the cards down from there, whether it's thumb drives, whether it's memory cards, whatever, because they, they just Nobody trusts the, the top of the range ones yet. Hmm. Um, but the the thing was that I see with this, okay, you could capture raw photos, you could catch them in, in burst mode. Um, but what I see it being useful for is actually being used as a swap drive in, like if you've got a card that's that fast in your yeah. phone, you could physically use it as a swap drive. Um, but the other thing is too, if you do say have a, 128 terabyte card with that sort of transfer rate then realistically for an average 4k video i mean 8k video it would they'll reckon it'll handle 8k video yeah um but even with 4k video being uh a 16th of that data if you'll get that sort of transfer speed and that sort of card size you could physically write the two separate sections of the card you know, one one pro you could have a program that writes to the top end, another program that writes to the bottom end. So they they physically write in two separate sections to the card at the same time. So you're basically creating a backup on that card in mm. real time, which I think would get around the reliability issue. Yeah. Um. But I think that's pretty cool. Just like. But actually, it's funny. I was looking at. Uh, I mean, where was I going? JB Harvey, JB or Harvey Norman, Harvey Norman, I think it was. And I had a look at their thing, and they've still got the CF cards, the compact flash cards. Yeah, they've still got the Sony. What are they, were they? Sony Duo, or whatever they called them. The they're proprietary got, ones. Yeah. <laughs> I was really surprised to see these things still being a an active card. You're going blurry again. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> there we go. Uh, that's how I, I mean. I, I'm physically seeing it blurry, regardless. So yeah. You said you were tired. <laughs> so no, I think it's a really good um, 
really good thing. It's interesting how whilst the tech, speed of technology in general, like computers and whatever, haven't necessarily got any faster, the development of the hard, the accessories and hardware associated with that has really accelerated. Uh, it's yep. almost like it's making up for it. You know, you're getting bigger and faster SD cards and thumb drives and SSD, and, uh, yeah. SSDs and smaller... Um, I'm just trying to find I had one here. Smaller Bluetooth and Wi-Fi dongles and a lot of those sort of accessories are getting smaller and smaller. So on the one hand, you're getting the actual technology. The hardware itself may not be necessarily improving in speed, but you're getting all these other accessories that are catching up. So it's making the hardware feel faster. Um, <clears throat> it won't. Yeah. And that's an adapter for this one. Yeah, the micro SD. <laughs> And it's yeah, it's, in, it's just interesting. I find like that's the thing with with the computer I've got now. This the actual processor spec isn't that much faster than a four year old processor, but the memory, the hard drives, the graphics card are all so far above what they were four years ago. Yeah, that the system's ten times faster. Like yeah, from the time I press the power button to the time I'm in a usable state of Windows ten. It's eight seconds. You don't have time to make a cup of tea anymore. That's my, sad. And my computer's mounted up on my shelf over here. So I literally, yep. have, I get, I walk past my desk, go to my computer, turn it on. By the time I turn around, come back, pull out my chair, sit down and put my chair back in, I'm at my desktop. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Mad. You know, gone are the days where you don't want to turn your computer off because it takes half an hour to boot back up again. Exactly. <laughs> That's why so many officers just left them on all the time. Yeah. And well, you come that, out, my computer's not working. Have you, yeah. When did you last reboot it? Uh, 2003. I mean, the thing is, too, when we still had spinning disks, this is a older, um, what size is this? It's an old 5400 laptop hard drive. I'm not sure Pushy bar? Yeah, it's a Hitachi. Hitachi. It's a uh, well, 320 gig. There we go. Yeah. Um, but... It's, uh, you know, when you had spinning drives and you had all the fans and you had um, CRT monitors and you had a lot of this stuff that was uh, susceptible to power surging, most systems that stayed on outlasted systems that were turned off every night. Yeah. Just because there wasn't that surge if that was affecting them. But these days, there's so little, you don't get like, when you turn a computer on, you don't get the massive power drain. Like you used to have to spin up the hard drive and spin up the optical media and spin up all these fans and spin up the, you know, um, and the power supply. You, you watch the voltage rails and that sag a lot because everything's trying to work at that split second you turned on. With the advent of all the solid state stuff, you don't have that. You turn the computer on and it's running at the same power it uses, unless you're running the graphics card really hard or something, it's pretty much running constantly the same. So, you don't get these massive spikes and surges, so all the equipment lasts longer, even if you are turning it on and off. So, yep. I was always one up and, and up until relatively recently, uh, until SSDs become commonplace, I was one that just didn't turn my computer off. Um, but now that you know, as I said, it, it it boots up so quick that there's absolutely no reason to not turn it off now. Yeah. Plus, you save yourself. I worked out it costs about a dollar a day to run the computer, unless you got your own secret solar system network yeah, yeah you know some battery dude just working off like an average pc you know with a house without solar or anything like that to have a computer on for 24 hours is about a dollar yeah for the for a newer a new spec computer with multiple with dual monitors you know sitting there just with it running a screensaver or whatever yeah. so you can cut your bill 30 bucks a month just by you know you probably cut all of that 30 dollars a month you could probably take i don't know 20 bucks a month off if you turn the computer off every night <laughs> Anyway, thanks for listening to the Aussie Tech Heads show broadcast weekly. We can be found at facebook.com slash Aussie Tech Heads, twitter.com slash Aussie Tech Heads, youtube.com slash Aussie Tech Heads, and now also at patreon.com slash Aussie Tech Heads. Sign mm -hmm. up for $4 a month, $10 a month, or $25 a month. See the site for details. Email us Glenn Will Warlock at AussieTechHeads.com.au. You can hear Aussie Tech Heads on Aussie Tech Radio, 24 7 back to back play of some of the best tech related shows from around Australia and New Zealand. New shows are added each Friday. See you next time.
Bye. Bye.